So, hi everyone. Welcome to the second session of POTC, the second regular session. Uh, it's a session on graph algorithms. So, our first speaker is uh, Michal Dori. So do you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm going to talk about fast algorithms for shortest paths in the congested click model. Um, I'm Michal, and this is a joint work with Marav Parter from Weizmann Institute. Okay. So I'm going to discuss very fast polylogogram round algorithms for approximate shortest paths in the congested click model. So we have a graph, we have weights on the edges, and our goal could be, for example, to compute all the distances in the graph, which is the all pair shortest path problem, APSP, or sometimes we are interested only in computing distances from a single source or multiple source. And we want to solve this task in a distributed setting, so we uh, look at the congested click model. Here we have a communication network of n vertices that commu communicate with each other uh, in all to all communication. Uh, the Vertices communicate by synchronous round, and they can send catalog and bit messages in each round. The input graph is distributed between the vertices. At the beginning, each vertex only knows the part of the input adjacent to it, and at the end, each vertex should only know a local part of the output, which is its uh, distances to other vertices. Okay, so we want to compute distances in this model, so let me first tell you what is known in this model. So the first results on this topic are algorithms based on matrix multiplications that compute distances exactly in polynomial time. So for example, if you want to compute distances in the most general setting, which is APSP in weighted directed cuts, you can do it in n to the third time. There are also uh, faster algorithms for other variants, but what is common to all these results is that they compute distances exactly and they require polynomial time. So we can ask what happens if we allow approximations. So it turns out that if we allow approximations, we can get much faster algorithms that take only polylogarithmic time. So for example, we can, in polylogarithmic time, get constant approximation for APs. So polylog is very fast, but you can still ask, is polylog the right answer? Or maybe we can get even faster algorithms for this problem. In this work, we show that it's actually possible to get much faster algorithms for this problem as long as we consider unweighted graphs. So we show algorithms that take only polylog log n number of rounds and get, for example, one plus epsilon approximation for the distances for a set of sources of size square root n or two plus epsilon approximation for all pair shorter space. Previously, it was, it was known how to get its results in polylog and complexity. So we show how we can get the same result in just polylog log n time. So let me tell you briefly about our techniques. So our general idea is to divide the shortest paths into two types, the long paths and the short paths. For long paths, we deal with something that is called a near additive emulator. For the short paths, we deal with something that we call a distance sensitive tool. So let me tell you briefly what are near additive emulators and why they are helpful for approximating distances. A near additive emulator is a sparse graph that preserves all the distances in the graph up to a near additive stretch. This means that for any pair of vertices in the graph, the distance between them in the emulator is 1 plus epsilon, the actual distance, plus beta. And something that is very good about this near additive emulator is that they give very good approximations for long distances. Okay, so if the distance between u and v is much larger than this beta, then you get this beta here becomes negligible and you get something that is much closer to a one plus epsilon approximation. So near additive emulators actually give very good approximations for long distances. So our approach is as following. We show that we can build very, very fast an emulator that is also very, very sparse, as near linear size. Since this emulator is very, very sparse, we can actually let all the vertices in the graph learn it very, very fast. And this already gives us very, very good approximations for long distances. Okay, so since this emulator is very sparse, uh, we can let all the vertices learn it. And as I said, 
this already takes care of the long distances. Okay, so the emulator takes care of long distances. What about short distances? So we now need to deal with shortcuts that have at most beta over epsilon edges. Here we show that we can exploit the fact that these pets are short in order to get fa fast complexity for this task. So if in general graphs, we need polylog n time to approximate shortest pets. If we want to approximate pets that have at most t edges, we can do it in polylog t time, which is going to be polylog log n for our choice of parameters. So to conclude, we divide the shortest pets into long and sh short according to some distance parameter beta. For long pets, the distance between them in the emulator already gives a good approximation. For the short ones, we show that we can get, uh, you exploit the fact that they are short to get very fast algorithms to approximate these pets. And based on these main ingredients, we get polylog log and round algorithms for approximate shortest pets in the congested tree. So we can get one plus epsilon approximation for multi source shortest pet, two plus epsilon approximation for all pair shortest pets, and irradiative approximation for APSP for this value of beta. Uh, so this was, so I'll conclude my talk here. But if you want to hear more about the topic, you're welcome to contact me. And of course, you're welcome to see the longer version of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, while I'm encouraging people to ask questions, but I also have a, a very maybe simple question. Uh, what breaks down if you try to apply your uh, techniques to weighted graphs? Yeah, so one thing is that the whole approach of this near additive emulator is works very good for unweighted graphs because intuitively in unweighted graph you can say, okay, I have some extra beta edges and this is not too much. In weighted graphs, these beta edges may have large weight. So this whole approach of near additive emulator doesn't work for weighted graphs and also there are other things that are like longer weight. So as a, as a follow-up question, if we limit the weight of the edges uh, for how large, uh, how large the weight of the edges can be to keep the complexity here? I mean, of course, it should work for constant uh, weights, uh, constant integer weights, but uh, log, log, logarithmic, polylogarithmic uh, lengths of edges or larger? Yeah, so, so I don't know. I will need to look at it in more detail to see. Like, intuitively, constant weight seems to be something that we can deal with, maybe also like polylog or something like this, but I will need to look at it more carefully. Any more questions? There is a question about lower bounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so the congested click is a model where it's difficult to show lower bounds because uh, connections to circuit complexity, but what I can tell you is that if we look, for example, at the approximation we get for APSP, we get 2 plus epsilon approximation, and you can ask whether I can get maybe better approximation in this time. So getting a better than 2 approximation for APSP is known to be equivalent to matrix multiplication, so we can't really hope to improve this unless we get like very fast algorithms for matrix multiplication. So this is not exactly a lower bound, but somehow some kind of conditional lower bound. Yeah. But other than this, in the congested click, it's very difficult to show, like it's difficult to show lower bound because connection to circuit complexity. So it's not clear if poly log log n is the right answer, or maybe you can actually get even something faster. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So I assume also others can hear you. Okay, okay. I think we can start. So the next speaker is Denis Olivetti. Denis, please go okay. ahead. So this is a joint work with uh, Sebastian Brandt. And uh, this talk is there is some echo. Okay. This talk is about truly tight in delta bounds for bipartite maximal matching and variance. Wait. Oh. Okay. And so, okay. Let's start from maximal matching. In the maximal matching problem, uh, we want to choose a subset of edges that do not share endpoints and such that this set is maximal, meaning that we cannot extend it. So in this talk, we are interested in the easy version of the problem, not maximum matching, but just maximal matching. The one that we can solve with a greedy algorithm in the centralized setting. And uh, uh, the question that we ha ask is how, how much hard is this problem in the distributed setting? So let's see what, uh, what we know about this problem. And uh, I just mentioned that the, the results that we will see hold in the uh, local model of distributed computing. But uh, here we will consider a simpler setting where we just have uh, uh, the port numbering model. So we, nodes do not have uh, IDs. We just have a bipartite graphs, graph where uh, nodes have just uh, a color. They know if they are black or white, and we have ports. And in this setting, we know that there is a very simple algorithm that solves maximal matching in uh, two delta minus one rounds of communication. And uh, uh, this is a very simple algorithm called the proposal algorithm. And uh, from last year, we know that this algorithm is asymptotically optimal. And we know that even in the local model of distributed computing, uh, the bipartite maximal matching problem requires uh, linear in delta uh, rounds of com communication. And uh, in this work, we prove the exact complexity of bipartite maximal matching. We prove that bipartite maximal matching requires exactly two delta minus one rounds. So, it doesn't only, does not only require linear in delta, it requires exactly two delta minus one rounds. Now, in this work, we do not only consider bipartite maximal matching, but we also consider variants uh, of this problem, more relaxed version of this problem that we call bipartite X maximal Y matchings. So let's see the definition. We have to choose a subset of edges such that every node is incident to at most Y edges of, uh, of the matching. So if we set y equal to one, we get the standard maximal matching. And uh, if a node is not matched, so not incident to any edge of the matching, then also uh, then other x neighbors can be unmatched as well. So these are more relaxed versions of uh, maximal matching. And uh, if we set x to zero and y to one, we get the standard maximal matching. So let's just see an example. Uh, in this graph, we can see an example of one maximal to matching because every node is matched with at most, uh, it, it is incident to at most two edges. And there are two unmatched uh, nodes, each one having at mo uh, one neighbor that is uh, unmatched. So one maximal to matching. And for, this, uh, for all this family of problems, we prove the exact complexity. We prove that bipartite X maximal Y matching requires exactly two times the ceiling of delta minus x over y, and that if some condition is satisfied, then we can actually shave off one round. So uh, this essentially says that uh, we cannot just slightly relax uh, maximal matching, for example, by putting constant values of x and y and obtain a much easier problem. If we have, have constant values of x and y, we still require linear in delta. Now, uh, it's actually easy to modify existing upper bounds, uh, the proposal algorithm to match this complexity. And the main contribution uh, in our work is actually proving the lower bounds. This is the hard part, proving the exact lower bound, the exact complexity of this problem. Now, I will just uh, conclude by briefly mentioning uh, the technique that we use. We, we applied the round elimination technique. That is a technique that has been used in the last uh, years to prove many interesting results. And uh, it works as follows. We are given a problem and there is a mechanical way 
to define a problem that is exactly one round easier. So this is round elimination. And what we do in our work is the following. For any value of x, y, and i, we show that we can define a problem that is exactly i rounds easier than x maximal y matching. And uh, the challenge in uh, doing this is keeping all these problems small. Because uh, a problem in this technique is actually um, that the result that we get through round elimination is a very huge problem. So we, we found the right simplification to perform such that we can obtain a whole family of problems that is small. Now, if you want to know more about the results, there is the YouTube video, you can ask questions. But if you want to know more about round elimination, there is also a Zulip channel where we just discussed that. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis. There is a question. Uh, does, the round, does the lower bound hold, hold for every delta or are there conditions such as being a function on uh, n? The lower bound that we prove is for uh, delta regular graphs. So if you want to solve the general case, you also have to solve that case. And then uh, in the port numbering model, this, uh, you can imagine an infinite graph uh, where this is the true complexity that is required. But when you lift the lower bound to the local model, then you get some, uh, the same lower bound in delta, the exact complexity in delta, but then you get also a complexity in n. We, you get some dependency on n. So delta cannot be huge. It must be at most some function of n then. So there is a raised hand from Yuval. Uh, I yeah. don't know if... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so two questions actually, if I may. Uh, the first uh, maybe is an appetizer for the discussion, uh, for the Zulip discussion on round elimination. Uh, Dennis, do you believe that uh, this technique may lead to um, exact bounds? I mean, not asymptotic, but rather exact bounds for other problems? Or was it a coincidence that it worked so well for this specific problem? Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, the round elimination technique itself is able to give a problem that is exactly one round easier. The, hard, the, the main issue is that we get a problem that is exponentially uh, larger. The description of the problem is larger. But uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it seems to be related to how much things an algorithm has to remember between rounds while solving the problem. And so for all problems that could be solved with, by using little memory, it seems that it could be possible to obtain exact complexity in this way. Okay, great. Uh, the second question is uh, this uh, XY relaxation of maximal matching. Can you think of uh, any applications of uh, such a relaxation? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, we wanted to basically understand if we could just slightly relax maximal matching and obtain something that could be solved much faster. So this is the family that we used, but uh, this is just an example of you could, what you could get through round elimination. I, I think that it could be easy to just do the same. Now that we have this result, at least, we could do the same for different variants, actually. I don't think, I don't think that we could do this just for this, uh, uh, this variant. So this is more like a proof of concept about what could be done with this technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, there is a, one last question from the uh, audience. Uh, is it possible that one could have a faster algorithm for other graphs or is it trivial that regular graphs are the hardest? Uh, the result is, uh, I mean, the family of hard instances is uh, delta regular trees. So maybe, I mean, it could be that uh, different families are easier actually. I, I just, I don't know actually. I mean. Uh, I don't know if one could exploit short cycles, for example. I mean, it could become easier, of course. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. Okay, uh, maybe let us move the discussion to, uh, to uh, Tulip and uh, let, let us proceed for the next talk since we are time constrained. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Thank you.
So our next speaker is Seth Asadi. Mm. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And you see the slides as well? Yes. Okay, so great. So hi everyone, my name is Sefer and I'm going to talk about this joint work with Gilad Kohl and Rata Moshman and on lower bonds for maximal matching and MIS, but in a slightly different model than the previous one that we talked about. It's the distributed sketching mode. Okay, so a quick recap of what is the problem. In the maximal matching problem, we have a collection of vertex disjoint edges, like these red edges. And the maximality means that this collection is not subset of any other matching. And similarly, in the MIS problem, we have a collection of vertices which are not adjacent to each other. And again, maximality means that they are not part of any other independence. And we are interested in solving these problems in this model, which is called the distributed sketching model. Here I have a graph G, let's say, and a bunch of vertices and edges. And there is one processor for every edge of this graph. Oh, sorry, one processor for every vertex of this graph. And the input of each processor are the edges of this particular vertex. So like this processor here is going to see these four edges. And right here, let me mention that this means that each edge of this graph is being seen by two different processors. Good. And here, uh, let's assume that the vertices have unique ID from one to N. And basically it means that the input of each processor is a bunch of other numbers corresponding to the IDs of other vertices, which are the neighbors. Now the way this model works is that we have also another referee or central coordinator that has no input. And the players are going to work as follows. They are going to look at their input graph and simultaneously send a message to this referee. And I'm going to call each of these messages as a sketch because it's basically just a summary of each player's neighborhood. And then referee is going to look at these uh, sketches and output a solution to the problem. And just one other technical thing here is that we are going to assume that the randomness used by the players are in fact shared between them. They have access to the same shared source of randomness. This is called a public randomness. So the goal in this model is to design communication efficient protocols, meaning that I want my protocol to only use polylogarithmic size of sketches as opposed to each processor is just sending its entire input. This is a model that has been studied after this breakthrough result by Ann Gohan McGregor that they were able to give an algorithm. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they were able to give an algorithm for finding a spanning forest of every graph with high probability using a very surprisingly small size of messages of just log cube n. And here n is the number of vertices. And basically building on this result, there have been numerous other problems that have been studied in this model, such as MST, vertex connectivity, approximate minimum or maximum cuts, and delta plus one vertex coloring. And let me highlight this result that we can also solve this problem again with log cube and size messages in this model. <coughs> In fact, this is a problem very closely related to maximal matching and MOS. So based on this, we were interested in understanding are there also communication efficient protocols for these two problems in this model? And that basically brings us to our result. The result is that the answer is no. This problem does not admit such as sketches. In fact, more formally, any algorithm that you have for this problem, even if it's randomized and works with constant probability of success, will require something like a square root and communication from an average node in the graph. So that's the result. And now let me very briefly talk about how do one prove such a result. 
but it's a communication complexity lower bound because we want to bond the communication from the players. And we have to work with an, in a model which has many, many players, which is called a multi-party communication model. And a quick recap of in the multi-party communication models, we usually work in one of these two models. The more a standard, so one a standard model, which is more familiar in the distributed community also is this number in hand model. We have one player and we have a bunch of players and each player gets as input just some part of the, so the input to each player is basically not shared. It's in his hand, he's the only one that sees the input. On the other extreme, we have this number on forehead, which you can think of the input on it. The, each player has some information written on its forehead. Everyone else can see this information except for that player. And so you can see that there is a crazy amount of input sharing in this model on the right. And based on this, it's easy to see that algorithms on the model on the right can be much stronger than the model in the left. And the same way proving lower bound on the right is much harder. In fact, we know that the strong lower bonds in this number on forehead employ lots of circuit complexity lower bonds, and as a result, we don't have that many lower bonds in the model on the right. And we can think of different degree of input sharing between the, these two models. And now, in the past, there's been many lower bonds for matching an MOS in model in the number in hand model, which are closely related to what we are doing in this paper. But the difference is that now in our model, we have this notion of input sharing. Remember that each edge is shared by two vertices on the, <coughs> each edge is shared by two vertices. And that's basically the source of the power in this model. The reason we can solve all these problems such as a spanning forest, etc. So we have to deal with some degree of input sharing. And just to quickly say something, the way we handle this is that we move this input sharing from the edges of the graph to the vertices in a way that we are going to work with a small number of high information vertices. These vertices know the graph very well and benefit from edge sharing, but the numbers are very small, so they cannot communicate enough so that the entire problem can be solved. And then we are going to have a very large number of vertices which do not have that information. So even collectively, they cannot solve the problem together. And as a result, they cannot benefit that much from it. Then we prove the lower bound. Good, so now let me give you some concluding remarks. We prove that omega square root n size are needed on the sketches for this maximal matching and maximal independence set problem. This basically means that there are no really efficient poly log size solution to these two problems in this model. And there are lots of questions remained open. Uh, my favorite question is to determine what is the right answer to this question in this model. A square root 10 does not seem to me to be the correct answer, but I'm also, we don't know any protocol better than order and communication. I'm not sure what is the correct answer though. Another interesting question is to understand multi-round algorithms. Here you can send a sketch, then the referee is going to respond back to the players. Maybe you can just share the messages with all the players, and then players continue doing this over multiple rounds. This is basically the broadcast congested click model. And here we know an order log and round algorithm for matching and a log log and round algorithm for independent set. And I should say these are on average order log and communication, not forces communication. Now we don't know any lower bond better than or a square root and lower bond for one round. So it will be very interesting if we can prove something here. And then finally, these two problems are very closely related to each other. And the way we prove the MIS lower bond is through some very specific reduction that works only for our hard instances. But in general, is there a way to relate these two problems and this model also in a communication efficient manner? That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you. Uh, while I invite uh, others to ask question, uh, let me just uh, make sure those are unconditional lower bounds. These are unconditional lower bounds, yes. Okay, what is the best upper bound we have for this problem? Is there anything sub, sublinear in N that we have here? And we don't know. 
really in one round we don't know anything better if i only had two rounds then we could solve the problem with the square root and communication but in one round we don't know anything non-trivial there's a question can you get a uh, better than square root of n sketch size for some approximate uh, form of maximum matching uh good so in fact our result work for the lower bond we have is for constant factor approximation to matching so then we don't we can't get constant factor if you want some alpha approximation n over alpha communication is easy i believe i think you might be able to even get n over alpha square yeah you should be able to get n over alpha square for instance, a square root 10 approximation to matching can be done easily with order log and size messages. And for the MIS also, one can look at some approximate notion of the MIS when you, there, are not many, there are not many edges inside the independent set or not many vertices can be added to the solution. And our lower one works, depending on how you define the problem, our lower one works approximately for this variance as well. But again, I don't know what can be said in general. Two more questions. Uh, so one question is asked, uh, can this be used to prove lower bounds for the congested clique, even very low number of rounds, like let's say at least two or three rounds of congested clique? Uh, good. So this, if, so this relates to this multi-round algorithm question that I asked. You can use it to prove lower bonds in the broadcast congested clique model. If you prove a two-round lower bond, it will imply a two-round lower bond in the broadcast model. But when you allow unicast communication in the, in the congested clique, it really turns it into a circuit. So asking a question of whether can we prove two or three-round lower bond for this problem, is effectively asking if we can prove two or three lower bonds for circuits of depth two or three for these problems. That is not beyond what people can prove. I mean, depth two or three, maybe we can still prove something, but I'm not sure. It will not follow from this type of approach if you allow unicast. Another question is, uh, is this lower bound uh, also extends to relaxations uh, uh, of the problem, let's say, to relaxations of uh, maximal independent set, for example, two ruling sets. Uh, I'm not sure. I've not thought about them actually ever, so I'm not sure. I'd be happy to think about them and answer this question later. And last question from uh, from the audience. Uh, I would encourage the discussion to move to, to Tulip. Uh, how close is this, this model to one round algorithms in the broadcast congested click model? I mean, I would assume they are the same. No, the only difference here is that we allow sharing of public randomness. Uh, but other than that, I would assume they are exactly the same. Okay, thank you. I have to uh, keep the schedule. Uh, it's a very interesting talk, very interesting discussion. Okay, thank you, everyone. So the next speaker is uh, uh, Will Rosenbaum. Uh, Will, I have unmuted you. Okay, great. Everyone can hear me? And you can see my screen, I hope? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm Will Rosenbaum, and I'm going to talk to you about some joint work with Yuka Suomela um, called Seeing Far Versus Seeing Wide, the Volume Complexity of Local Graph Problems. So uh, in this paper, we introduce what we call uh, the volume model for distributed computing. 
And uh, as we're all used to, um, a network is modeled by a graph and the nodes represent processors. And in this model, each node adaptively queries its known neighborhood. So in T rounds, each node can see at most T other nodes in the network, and each new query needs to be a neighbor of a known node, and queried nodes should form a connected component at the end, since you're only querying neighbors of neighbors. Uh, the complexity measure that we associate with this model is called the volume, or we call it the volume, which is the number of nodes queried. So you take the maximum all over all nodes in the network of the number of nodes each one queries. So here's just a quick illustration of the model. So if we're playing the role of the central node in the network here, um, after one round, I can ask for one neighbor and I get that neighbor's ID and their degree and uh, the identity of the edge between them. So like the, the port numbers of the endpoints. And then another round, I can query for another neighbor and then subsequent um, queries give me new nodes. So after five rounds, I can see at most five nodes in the network other than myself. So um, why do we look at volume? What's, why do we introduce this model? Um, so what we're kind of interested in is looking at a refinement of the local model. So in the local model in T rounds, um, each node can see its entire radius uh, T neighborhood. But we wanted to ask what happens when you actually have to pay for querying each node individually. So a more kind of applied reason that we might care about this model is that a lot of these uh, um, APIs, for example, for social networks like Twitter and Facebook, limit the number of requests that each user can make to the data structure. And, um, and this volume model seems like kind of some natural queries. So we want to count the number of requests that you need to make to the data structure in order to solve your problem. And then finally, um, as we show in the paper, uh, this model has connections to massively parallel computation or the MPC model. Essentially what we show is that if you come up with an algorithm in the volume model that has small volume, uh, then you can transform it into an MPC protocol that uses few rounds and small space. So this has been a, a pretty active um, field recently. And so we, we were, this was one of our main motivations was kind of understanding how volume and massively parallel computation relate to one another. So our main goal uh, uh, in the paper is to understand the volume complexity of problems in distributed computing. And we focus on locally checkable labeling problems. So these are problems defined on bounded degree graphs. Um, they're defined to have a finite number of input states and output states per node. And the solutions can be verified locally. And of course, many of the, the well-studied problems in distributed computing are LCLs. For example, proper coloring, maximal independent set, maximal matching, and so on. And LCLs have recently been very well understood in the local model, that is with respect to what we call distance complexity. Um, and so the tools for the local model give us both um, uh, tools that we can apply to the volume model and uh, gives us the, the sorts of questions that we might wanna ask about the volume model. Um, so just really briefly, I, I wanna mention what I see as being the highlights of the paper. Um, so the first highlight for me is, is the connections that we draw between our model and other models in, in distributed computing. So um, it's similar to the local model or it can be viewed as a refinement of the local model. Um, our model is very similar to the local computational algorithm or sent local models. Um, and we also draw connections to massively parallel computation. So these are, um, uh, you know, so this kind of situates this work with respect to previous works. Um, two things that were uh, surprising to us in the paper are uh, results that I'll just mention on a very conceptual level. So the first surprise for us was that randomization helps for global problems. So in the local model, it's recently been shown that you cannot get a very large speed up from randomized algorithms compared to deterministic algorithms, at least for LCLs. Um, and we show that that's not the case for volume complexity. So um, randomization can actually give you an exponential speed up in solving global problems uh, in the volume model. And then the second surprise is that even if you restrict to a fixed distance complexity class, say problems with log n deterministic and randomized distance complexity or log n complexity in the local model, um, you could have an infinite hierarchy of volume complexities of distinct volume complexities uh, inside of those problems. So these, these were two kind of surprising things that are uh, the main results of our paper. 
And then finally, uh, it's not, I don't know if it's fair to call it a contribution, but a highlight for, for me is that there are a lot of questions that our paper um, uh, brings up that, um, that we would like to investigate further, but we would also like to enlist help investigating. So if you go to the, the full version of the paper on the archive, um, we have, I think, four or five pages um, discussing open questions and further research problems, and um, as, as well as some commentary on how we might think you can attack these problems and why we think they're valuable. Okay, so that's everything that I wanted to say in terms of an advertisement for the paper. Um, so thank you all for your attention. Thank you. There, is a, there are already two questions. One question okay. is, I don't know if you can see them, but uh, one question is about, uh, is it use, useful for volume com complexity lower bounds to study uh, lower bounds uh, where you can query not only uh, when, when you can query any nodes, not only adjacent ones? Uh, um, so this is a good question. And I think, um, so the lower bound techniques that we use generally do apply to the case where you're allowed so-called non-local queries. So you can query anywhere in the graph. Um, but the, the value of those kinds of queries is, so first of all, it's known to not be very helpful in, for LCLs, um, these sorts of queries in terms of, of complexity. And also, you know, in, in the model, if you don't know anything about the, the rest of the graph, it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, um, yeah, it it's, shouldn't be too surprising, I don't think that non-local queries don't help a lot, but uh, it's something that, I, that we haven't formalized in the paper at least, but this is a good, certainly a good question to ask. There's another question. Uh, there's a question, what happens uh, when you consider a model when if you query a node, you can learn everything that node has learned so far? Um, so we don't consider that. Um, I'm trying to think, so you don't quite get the full local model if you do that, um, but we, um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it, this is something similar to um, uh, a couple of questions that we mentioned in the paper, um, and this is another a good thing that we didn't mention, but um, yeah, for example, you can imagine that uh, instead of kind of pulling information from other nodes, you push information. So I can like leave a message for another node about what I learned that that node will have available to it when it wakes up. And, uh, and this is another kind of uh, model of, of thinking about these sorts of problems. But yeah, I mean, there's a ton of tweaks to the model that you could imagine. And I, you know, I think if, if you find connections with, you know, other things like massively parallel computation with these connections, it's definitely worth pursuing them further. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I don't, I don't see any more questions. So let us move to, to the next speaker. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Gopal. Gopal uh, Pandurangan. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. You can start whenever you feel like. Okay. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Uh, so, this is our paper. Uh, Oops. Sleeping is efficient. Uh, MIS in constant rounds, node averaged away complexity. I'm Gopal Pandurangan from University of Houston. This is joint work with Somitam Chatterjee of Georgetown and Robert Jimmer of Microsoft. So everybody knows that MIS is one of the central problems in distributed computing. It's been extensively studied for the last four decades and almost a touchstone for understanding local problems. Uh, so about almost 40 years back, uh, the two famous algorithms were presented for MIS. They are both randomized and they ran on log in rounds with high probability. And after 40 years, it's still the best known time for uh, computing MIS in general graphs. That's log in rounds. And uh, we have also the well known uh, lower bound of Kuhn et al. 
that shows that uh, there is an absolute lower bound of minimum of log delta by log log delta and square root of log n by log log n rounds for computing an MIS by uh, randomized algorithm and a deterministic algorithm. And this means that, for example, when delta is somewhat small, let's say little omega of two to the square root log n, then one cannot open for algorithms that are faster than square root log n by log log n rounds. So that's sort of an absolute lower bound that one can hope for MIS algorithms. So till now, essentially all distributed algorithms that we have known that have been studied for like last four or five decades, they are focused on measuring the worst case number of rounds to finish. So that is the worst case complexity. And in this paper, what uh, we take is a new approach for designing distributed algorithms. And this is motivated by energy concentrations partly. So for example, if you look at uh, ad hoc wireless and sensor networks, for example, where MIS is a, is an, can be an important subroutine, a major concern in these networks is saving the total amount of energy spent by nodes, or equivalently the average energy a node spends during the algorithm. So in such networks, significant energy is spent by a node even when it is just idle. So that's when a node is just waiting to hear from a neighbor, even when it is not sending or receiving, a significant energy is spent by the node. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the energy consumption of a node when it's sleeping, it's significantly less. So in this state, a node has completely switched off its communication devices and it's not sending, receiving or lis listening, then the energy is very less. Okay, so in the sleeping model, what that we define in this paper, uh, a node may judiciously enter and exit sleeping sleeping mode to save energy. So, for example, in the in the real world, I mean, the IEEE MAC protocol actually provides support for switching between states. So, a node can enter sleeping state and wake up at a specified round in a later uh, in a later round. So the sleeping model captures this phenomenon by imposing no cost for nodes when they are sleeping. And only the nodes, only the nodes that are awake are counted. So only the rounds that a node is awake are counted. And uh, formally in the sleeping model, a node can be in two states, asleep or awake. And start of the execution, every node is in the awake state. And, and any a node V can decide to sleep starting at any round of its choice and then it can move to the awake state uh, at a later round okay and when they awake we assume that all nodes know the correct round number okay so again while their node is up, asleep a node does not send or receive messages and the important thing is it, the messages sent to it are also lost so there's no buffering or anything like that and that is the thing that that closely models the real world. So when the node is sleeping, it's as though it's dead. Okay, so the sleeping model is, uh, just to summarize, is actually a, a very simple modification of the, the standard congest or local model, where a node can be in two states, sleeping or awake, and only awake rounds are counted, sleeping rounds are ignored for time complexity or message complexity or whatever. Okay. So in this uh, uh, model, so we can define what we call as uh, awake complexity. And there are two flavors of awake complexity. One is the node averaged awake complexity. That means, uh, let's say for deterministic algorithms, let AB be the number of awake rounds needed by a node to finish its computation. Okay, So that means AB counts only the number of rounds in which the node is awake. Then the node averaged awake complexity is simply the average of these AVs. Okay, and for randomized algorithms, this AB can be a random variable. That is the number of awake rounds. And uh, you can define a random variable that is the average of these random variables. And the expected node average awake complexity of, the, of a randomized algorithm is simply the expectation of this random variable. Okay, and uh, so in this paper, for example, we focus on mainly the expected node average awake complexity of a randomized algorithm, however, however, one can study other properties of this uh, awake complexity random variable, like high probability bounds or whatever. Okay, and you can also study a worst case awake complexity, that is the worst case number of awake rounds taken by a node to finish. And uh, this is simply the max of all the AVs. And besides this, we have the traditional worst case complexity, where which is the 
which is what has been used for the last four decades. That is simply the worst case number of rounds a node will node takes to finish its algorithm. This counts both the awake and sleeping rounds. Okay, so the central question that we address in this paper is, can we design a distributed MIS algorithm with constant rounds, node average awake complexity? Okay, this is partly motivated by uh, the fact that we need energy efficient algorithms. That's one thing. But it's also motivated by the theoretical consideration that if you look at worst case complexity, there is absolute lower bound of square root of n log, square root of log n by log log n rounds, and can we do better? Can we design better algorithms? Okay, so the main result of this paper is that uh, we can design an algorithm that has constant node average of a complexity. Okay, in fact, we define two algorithms. The second sleeping MIS and fast sleeping, fast sleeping MIS. The second one is a simple modification of the first one. So the first one has constant node average of a complexity, log n worst case of a complexity. That means a node is awake only for log n rounds in the worst case. And it has polynomial worst case of a complexity and polynomial node average of a complexity. That means average complexity without counting both the sleeping and awake rounds. That is in the traditional sense. And the fast sleeping MIS is a simple improvement of this, which uh, keeps the node average awake complex to be constant. Uh, it improves the worst case of a, uh, it keeps the awake com worst case of a complex to be log n, but improves the worst case complexity and node average complexity to poi log, poi log rounds. So in particular, log to the 3.4 n rounds. Okay, so that is the main result of the paper. So I, I mean, the actual algorithm is actually a uh, a very simple recursive divide and conquer algorithm for MIS. It's actually a new algorithm for new, but a simple algorithm for MIS. That's what achieves this, uh, this constant node average of a complexity, which is the main goal of the paper. So this is in the full video and also in the paper. So let me conclude with uh, some open questions. Uh, so can we get a distributed MIS algorithm with both constant node average of a complexity and log n worst case complexity. That means log n traditional complexity. For example, like Luby, which has log n worst case complexity. And uh, so after the publication of a paper, I mean, uh, so Mohsen sent me a paper, sent me his work, which actually answers this question. So it gives a uh, MI algorithm that has constant uh, node average of a complexity with high probability, in fact, and log n worst case traditional complexity. And the second question that is very interesting, I think is important is, can we get a distributed MIS algorithm with constant or even little of log n node averaged complexity in the traditional model? That means if I don't count, uh, if I also count sleeping, so there's no sleeping or awake rounds. So this is nobody knows. I don't, nobody knows whether such an algorithm exists. And uh, I think the most interesting line of research is, can we design better distributed algorithms for other important graph problems, the sleeping model? Uh, because I, I believe that, uh, so, I mean, we are not really exploited, uh, uh, I mean, we are not really paid enough attention to the, to the energy considerations or the, the resource considerations of nodes. Uh, when you look at a vast distributed network, most nodes might not be doing anything for most of the time. So that has not really been exploited in, the, in, 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 the, in understanding the complexity of these problems. So I think the sleeping model takes a step towards that. So can we design better distributed algorithms for other graph problems? Thank you. Thank you. So there is a question, it's a question about the precise statement of the model, which is what exactly does not see when uh, the node uh, wakes up? Is it uh, the current system round number or on awake round number? Uh, it knows the, I mean, it knows the current total overall round number. It knows, so that assume there's a global synchronized plot. So we, we have a synchronous model. So, so it knows the absolute time, for example. Yeah, the absolute round number. <clears throat> Is this a question, can the node be woken up by an incoming message? No, that's the point. So when it is sleeping, it's completely dead. That's why all the messages sent to it are lost. And this is actually one of the challenges in designing algorithms as model. So this is the more realistic model. So there have been previous models defined, even we have defined a model 10 years back where we assume that when a node is sleeping, it buffers the message sent to it. It can wake up, either it can be woken up or it sees the message after it wakes up, but that's not realistic. So, I mean, that means 
that is still takes a lot of energy though. So when the node is sleeping, it's completely dead, basically. Okay, last question is about uh, that the uh, results in a deterministic model. Uh, can anything be done here? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So, uh, so our, uh, I mean, the, so our algorithms are all randomized though. So it's not clear whether you can do anything deterministic. So that's a very, it's still an interesting question. So the same, that means my, my open question. So if it is deterministic, the problem is still not solved. I mean, so if you want deterministic, I think that's still a very interesting question. So in the randomized thing, I mean, solved means what? You can get constant, which is obviously the best possible for node average complexity and log in, I don't know, I mean, improving log in general is a different thing. I mean, that's still open, but we can get log, constant and log in though, randomized, but uh, deterministic, it's not clear. I think it's a very, very interesting open question. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are time constrained. Let us move to another speaker. Uh, th thank you for the talk. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Philip Schneider. Okay, I hope you can hear me. And yes, it's start. Okay, great. So I'm quickly going to tell you about computing shortest paths and diameter in the hybrid network model. This is joint work with Fabian Kuhn. And since this is still a fairly new model, I'm going to mainly introduce it and then tell us about it and tell you about the results. So as a small motivation, imagine a bunch of smartphones, then these might typically be able to communicate in a point-to-point -point fashion over the cellular network, but also directly among each other via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Then we model the hybrid model um, as follows. Um, essentially, we assume the synchronous message passing model where we have two different communication modes. First of all, we have a global communication mode, which we consider short ranged but fast. And we call this the local network and model it with a graph. Then we have the global communication mode, which is uh, point to point, but rather slow. And we call this the global network and model it with a click on top of the graph. So in its most general form, um, the paper that introduced this model earlier this year um, considers the hybrid network model as follows. Um, so we have the local network where we are allowed to send or receive lambda bits over each edge per round. And we have the global network where each node is allowed to send or receive gamma bits in a point-to-point -point fashion. Let's consider the whole um, parameter space over lambda and gamma. Then this covers um, some well-known models. So obviously for um, unbounded lambda and no global communication, we get a local model. If we have polylog n bits um, over the local network, we get a congest model. If we allow roughly n log n bits over the global network and no local communication, we get something which is uh, essentially equivalent to the congested click model. And if we are very restrictive and allow only polylog n bits over the global network, we get what is called the node capacitated click model, which was introduced last year. So that leaves us still with a large space of uh, possible hybrid networks. And Augustine et al. argued that reality is best reflected if we leave the local network completely unrestricted and the global network um, very restrict the global network a lot. So they define the hybrid model as the combination of the node capacitated click model and the local model. And that's what we consider the hybrid network in our paper. So I still have only enough time to talk about the contributions we make in our paper. So 
as it turns out, as was already shown in the previous paper, the hybrid model has some fundamental limits, so it's not too powerful. In the previous paper by Augustine et al, they show a uh, square root of n, roughly square root of n lower bound for the all pair shortest path problem. And we show that we can slightly adapt this lower bound to a square root of k um, lower bound for the k sources shortest path problem, even for very crude um, approximations. For the diameter problem, we had to work a bit more. So we show that uh, it takes roughly n to the one third rounds to compute the diameter exactly. And it takes the same number of rounds to compute the two minus epsilon approximation for the weighted diameter. On the algorithmic side, we show that we can solve the exact all pair shortest paths problem and square root of n rounds. And what was previously known is that it can be done in n to the two third rounds, which is due to the previous paper by Augustine et al. And as we have seen from the lower bound, this is tied up to polylog factors. And any reasonable approximations cannot be computed much faster. Our second result is um, for the k source shortest path problem. So we show that we can um, compute constant approximation in roughly square root of k rounds, provided that the number of sources is large enough. And uh, the approximation parameter depends on the number of sources and whether the graph is weighted or unweighted. And as we have seen from the lower bound, this is also tied up to polylog factors. Our third result is that we can solve the single source shortest path problem in roughly n to the 0.4 rounds. Um, the previous result for this was square root of d rounds, where d is the diameter of the graph. So our result is really better for um, graphs with a large diameter. And for the diameter problem, we show that approximations can be achieved in sublinear time. So specifically, we get a three over two plus epsilon approximation in n to the one third rounds and the one plus epsilon approximation in n to the roughly 0.4 rounds. So um, yeah, for more and specifically for our techniques with which we achieve these results, namely the token routing protocol, I want to refer to the full talk on YouTube and. Uh, of course, to the paper. Other than that, um, thanks for listening, and I'm open for questions if there's any time left. Thanks. I don't see any questions from uh, from the Zoom chat, but I have a question. Can you go uh, back one slide? Yes. Where does this complexity in exponent 0 0.397 comes from? Is it from matrix multiplication or something related? Yes, exactly. It's uh, essentially from the matrix multiplication um, parameter. And yeah, we rounded this a bit. So, so uh, what happens when omega is 2? Then this constant becomes? Um, also n to the 1 third, yes. Uh, there's a question, uh, are there any upper lower bounds for hybrid model that scale in terms of lambda and gamma? So far, we looked at a hybrid model only from the perspective of those specific choices of uh, lambda and gamma. But I guess, yeah, um, more work could be done in respect to general lambda and gamma. But I guess in some sense this opens Pandora's box because uh, different because different lambda and gamma will probably um, result in different approaches for each choice of those. But yeah, nobody has looked into that yet. That would be interesting to see. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's a second question. Uh, how do the bounds uh, for hybrid uh, model relate to bound in node congestive? So there's some connection between hybrid and node congested click. So specifically in our paper, we show that we can simulate a node congested click for a small, um, small subset of nodes. Um, what this implies in terms of lower bound is, uh, yeah, I guess we have this, uh, we have this um, sort of simulation result where any algorithm for the um, node congested click, any shortest paths algorithm 
has some sort of uh, automatic consequences um, for the hybrid model. And if you have a lower bound for the node, uh, for the um, congested click model, you might be able to get also automatically lower bounds for the hybrid model. But I guess for the node congested click, uh, for the um, congested click model, lower bounds are way too long to have some impact for the hybrid model. But that's uh, just, uh, yeah, just an assumption or a feeling I have. So yeah, we might have an online discussion about that. I need to think about it. Okay, maybe let us move the discussion to the, the more of a chat base and let us move to the next speaker. Thank you, Philippe. So our next speaker is Krzysiek Nowicki. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes. That's good. Now I only have to share screen. That's also good. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Then let me begin because we are already late. Uh, this talk is about some MPC algorithmics I did together with Mox and Gapari, and it's going to be on minimum cuts. And, and by MPC model, we understand a model that tries to capture what happens in industry when they try to implement some parallel algorithms for big data sets. Basically, we have a model of computation in which we have synchronous rounds, and in each round, there is some local computation happening and some communication happening. Basically, local computation takes the communication from previous round and produces communication for the next round. And the only limitation on the communication is that each machine is source and the destination of at most S messages. And for inputs of size N, we aim at algorithms that have more or less global communication that's proportional to the size of the input. And usually for the MPC model, well, not usually. In this talk, we consider version of MPC that has nearly linear local memory or sublinear local memory. As for the problem we uh, talk about, uh, we talk about minimum cut problem, which for weighted graph asks us to find the lightest set of edges such that if we remove them, make the graph disconnected. So on this example, on this example on which uh, we have unweighted graph, the green edges form a minimum cut or those green edges also form a minimum cut. Basically, application of this problem could be to measure quality of your communication network. Because you can ask whether you have some communication bottleneck between some of the vertices on the left and some of the vertices of the right, or you could ask whether your communication network is vulnerable. I mean, the question would be, what is the number of edges that ha have to undergo some failure to prevent communication between the vertices in the, in the network? Okay, so as for results for this problem, previous results all previous results have something to be desired from them. Basically, there is one constant round algorithm for the minimum cut problem, but it has this problem that it uses large local memory. Then there is uh, this year minimum cut prop, uh, algorithm for unweighted simple graphs, but it has this problem that it works only for un unweighted simple graphs. And then we can simulate a bunch of parallel RAM algorithms, but their problem is that even if Though they can be implemented with small local memory, the round, round complexity is something along, around log cube. So our goal is to get optimal algorithms for weighted graphs without violating too much the global bound on the global memory. And by optimal, we think that getting the same complexity as for the connectivity problem would be nice. Basically, because we cannot get better. On the other hand, mm, we don't really get and better lower bounds, so this goes down to be as good as we can get. And for linear memory MPC, we get exactly that. We get constant round algorithm that uses only open local memory. And as for the global memory, we use n times polylog n. So if you want to improve this result, you can shave off this polylog n factor from the global memory. 
Uh, for sublinear memory regime, we get an algorithm for two plus epsilon approximation that needs only log n times log log n rounds. So under two cycle conjecture, it's uh, log log n rounds far from optimal because two cycle conjecture says that you need at least log n rounds to compute connectivity. On the other hand, if you have two plus epsilon approximation for me, MUCAT, you can verify connectivity. So this is at most log log n factor away under this conjecture. And since we are a little bit late, I will tell only a few words on building blocks. For linear memory, we use a t-packing approach. For sublinear memory, we use a recursive contraction approach. And the first building block, which is rather simple, is a skeleton building algorithm. And by skeleton, we understand a graph that has size of log n and approximate sizes of all small cuts. And for large cuts, we only have we want the guarantee that they are not small. And then for linear memory, having this skeleton building algorithm, uh, we basically, uh, the, the, uh, the sequential algorithm for um, minimum cuts usually says that if you have a nice skeleton, then we can compute a set of trees such that some of those trees have at most two edges in the minimum cut. Then the problem, becomes given a tree, you have to find the minimum cut that has at most two edges in this tree. And to implement this in the MPC, we show that you can decompose your tree into short paths such that if you compute some extra information for them, you can find all cuts that have one edge in this path. And for the sublinear memory MPC, uh, we based our algorithm recursive contraction approach. Uh, we also use skeleton building as one of the building blocks of the algorithm because this, this skeleton building algorithm we have basically gives you an n log n edge graph. So whenever we reduce the number of vertices by the contraction, then we can apply the skeleton building algorithm and reduce the number of edges. So if you have rec recursive contractions that reduce the number of edges, re re reduce the number of vertices, then we can apply skeleton building and reduce the overall, overall space. Then we, ha we have to do some modifications to recursive contraction approach. Basically, the original says that if you contract your graph a little bit, twice, and then solve recursively on each of the contracted graphs, your problem, then you have decent probability of finding the minimum cut. Now we have two observations. One observation is that instead of two trials, you can do several trials, and then you have you, you can contract your graph a little bit more aggressive. So the goal is to reduce the depth of the recursion. And the other observation is that if you care only about two plus epsilon minimum cuts, you can execute your rec recursive contractions in a way that after one level of recursion you reduce the number of vertices. And this extra space is actually enough to speed up our algorithm because instead of log n depth of the recursion, you can get log log n depth of the recursion. So we also propose some divide and conquer algorithm to solve some sub problem that emerges along the way. But apparently you can solve it in some, also using some other algorithmics, but we didn't use this under the submission, so the OTC version of paper doesn't mention that, but the full version that's available on archive or soon to be available on archive is going to cover this. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thanks for staying to the last talk. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or later on my email. Thank you, Krzysiek. Um, so far, I don't see any questions from the audience. So you get some polylog overhead in your memory, right? Uh, yes, for the linear, yes, that's. How severe is this polylog? Uh, it's like log to the five, but it prevents us in, uh, okay, whenever you have algorithm that has O of M global memory, you can just apply it to congested click and Given that this is m times log to the five, you cannot do that unless your graph is somewhat sparse. 
So that, that's why it's bad, this overhead, but it's not as, it's not like log n to the hundred. There's a question. Uh, if you want a global memory of uh, tilde O of n beyond the input size, does your result imply something? Uh, yes, if you would get m plus n times polylog, then you can simulate this in congested click. Basically, any algorithm that has a communication complexity that's O of n plus O of n squared, and, li and linear local memory can be implemented in a congested click. But here I don't really see how to avoid at least one log n for repetition of the algorithm in parallel. Because it's like you get constant, you get algorithm that has some constant probability of success and then you repeat it in parallel. And I think this log n is difficult to avoid here. Uh, no, no, so there's a cl clarification. Does okay. your result imply something with limited global memory, even in a log n round? <laughs> okay, I think that I think the answer is no, because if you want to get a local memory to be of n, then you have to throw into the mix some extra contractions and they impose this additional polylogarithmic factor on the global memory. So you cannot really, so it's like either you use n log n local memory and you need log n rounds to run the algorithm to just gather the, the, the skeleton or you need some extra global memory. So the best you can get out of it in congested click is like log n round exact, I think. I think that was the question, that whether you can implement in congested click. Yeah, I think you answered the question. Hmm? I, I think you answered the question. I, I see a con confirmation on the chat. Okay. Okay, so I think that concludes uh, this session. So uh, it also concludes POTSI for, for today. Thanks everyone for attending.